Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. So he was eight, eight years old when he became king? Yep. I'll believe that when pigs fly. Get back down here, you know you can't fly. So let's get right into it today as we continue our little series called When Pigs Fly. Today we are going to look at a kid who became a king. You know, kids get a bum rap nowadays, don't they, for being lazy and for being disinterested. And yet there are some kids that just do extraordinary things at a very young age. Take, for example, Malala. Malala grew up in Pakistan, and she had a love for education that she received from her dad. Well, I don't know if you know this about Pakistan, but the Taliban is there, and the Taliban doesn't like the fact that girls go to school. Well, Malala couldn't understand why the rest of the world wasn't doing something about this, and so she began to write to the BBC, sending videos to the BBC, asking them to report upon this atrocity. And the more the BBC began to report upon it, the Taliban got more and more angry, and they began to give death threats to the this poor girl, telling her to be quiet and stop saying these types of things. But this kid was relentless. Well, in 2013, she's walking home from school, and the Taliban attack her, and they shoot her in the head. Now, somehow, some way, she survived the attack. Of course, it brought worldwide outcry. Finally, the Pakistani people said, enough is enough. They signed a petition. Millions of people signed the petition so that girls could go to school. In 2013, 2014, Malala won the Nobel Peace Prize. She did all of that before the age of 18. That's what you call an extraordinary kid. Or take, for example, the young boy by the name of Easton. He goes to this science fair, and he sees a girl with a prosthetic hand. He strikes up a conversation with her. The hand will only open and close. That's all that it will do. He said, well, how do you like the function of the hand? She said, honestly, it's not that great, but it's better than nothing. He said, how much money did your mom and dad and yourself spend to get that hand? She said, $80,000. He said, that's absolutely ridiculous. I can make a better hand than that. The kid is 14 years old. So he goes home, he puts together Legos and fishing wire, and one prototype after another prototype after another prototype, he comes up with a more functioning hand that can be uh, bought for less than $1,000. Now, you're going to like this kid an awful lot because by the age of 17, NASA came calling. Yes, this 17-year-old kid works for NASA in the robotics department. And rather than him putting patent after patent after patent on his discoveries of robotics, you know what he does? He puts it on the internet. He lets everybody have the information in hopes that somebody can improve upon what he's already come up with. That, my friend, is an extraordinary young man. When we read through the Bible, we read about extraordinary people. For example, David was 17 years old when he runs out onto that battlefield to take on the giant Goliath. Think about the little boy who gives Jesus his lunch, just five little small loaves of bread and two small fish, and Jesus takes that lunch and blesses that lunch and breaks that lunch and multiplies it, and 5,000 men, not counting women and children, were fed on that day. Even throughout history, we see one extraordinary teenager after another. When Joan of Arc was 17 years old, she led her armies against the English. When Mozart was six years old, he composed his first symphony. And when Thomas Jefferson was in middle school, he penned the Declaration of Independence. That last one's a lie. Just want to make sure you're still with me. That's all I cared about at that point. But it would have fit the point really nicely, don't you think? So today we're going to look at a kid who becomes a king. His name is Josiah, and his story is found in 2 Kings chapter 22. Let's look at it. It says, Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father, David. Now, now, now David, let me be honest, David was not his father. David comes years earlier. There's a reason why the kid says David is his father. It's because he doesn't uh, respect his own dad. 
He doesn't respect his grandfather as well. He's looking for a role model, and he chooses David to be his role model because David is a man after God's own heart. Look what it, it continues. It says, Josiah did not turn aside to the right or to the left. In other words, he stayed focused on the person that God wanted him to become. He said, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. Look at verse 25. The Bible says, neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did. He turned to the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his strength. Doesn't that sound like the greatest commandment that Jesus said? If you want to get to the end of your life and have no regrets, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. If you look at the reign of Josiah compared to David, you'll see that Josiah was more committed to the things of God than even David was. Now, this is a shocker to me, because if you know the family tree of Josiah, you would think, why didn't he just follow in his dad's footsteps? Why didn't he follow in his grandfather's footsteps? I mean, that's most of the time, that's what kids do, right? They kind of follow along, and they take on the same tendencies, the same beliefs, the same habits as their mom and their dad do. Well, for Josiah, his grandfather and his father were not nice people. His grandfather was a guy by the name of Manasseh, and Manasseh was an evil and wicked person. This is what the Bible says about him. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the detestable practices of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. Verse 6 says, Manasseh also sacrificed his own son. So here we got a guy who's a pagan worshiper. Basically, he's a Satanist, and he's so into his Satanistic religion that he sacrifices his own son to this pagan god. Says this, he practiced sorcery and divination. He consulted with mediums and psychics. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. Look at verse 16. Manasseh also murdered many innocent people until Jerusalem was filled from one end to the other with innocent blood. This was in addition to the sin that he caused the people of Judah to commit, leading them to do evil in the Lord's sight. This is not what you call a great role model for a young boy. Hey, tell me about your grandfather. Well, he's a Satanist who practices divination and sorcery, and he's murdered more people than we can count. Not a good role model. So you would think that the son of Manasseh, Amon, who was uh, Josiah's dad, would not follow in his father's footsteps, but he did. Look at what it says here, verse 20. Amon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father Manasseh had done. He followed the example of his father. He abandoned the Lord, the God of his ancestors, and he refused to follow the Lord's way. So here we got a kid, eight years old, looking at a grandfather who's evil, looking at a dad who is evil, and he says, you know what? I don't want to follow in their footsteps. I don't want to go their path. I don't want to be like them, which is kind of astonishing, isn't it? Because think about the power and the authority. Think about the fear that people had when these guys walked in. That can be attractive, can it, to have something like that? But Josiah says, no, 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 there's got to be a better way than this. Even at the age of eight, he's figured this out. Now, here's the question. What what were the things that happened to him that caused him to turn his attention over to the Lord? Well, I think there's two reasons. The first reason is because his dad was assassinated. Listen, you live an evil, wicked life. You rip people off left and right. You murder people. You're going to make enough enemies along the way. And eventually, those enemies are going to do you in. That's what happened to his dad. So who would want to follow in the footsteps of someone who's assassinated by his own people? But I think there was a second reason why Josiah turned to the Lord, and that's because his grandfather, Manasseh, in his old age, turned to the Lord as well. You see, the Assyrians came in, they laid siege, they took Manasseh back as their prisoner, and there in the prison, Manasseh called out to the one true living God. This is what the Bible says, and then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. Now, that would get your attention when a Satanist gives their lives over to Jesus Christ. You'd be like, whoa, what just happened right there, right? When a murderer gives his life over to Jesus Christ, that gets your attention, doesn't it? You see, Josiah learned a very important principle to life that unfortunately most people haven't quite figured out just yet. At the tender age of eight years old, here was Josiah's mantra. You ready? Honor God and he'll honor you. 
Now, write that down if you're taking notes. Put that someplace this next week and think about it. Am I honoring God? Because if you honor God, he will honor you. Now, listen, if you play games with God, if you dishonor God, if you act like your sin isn't that big of a deal, if you have areas of your life that you haven't given over to the control of God, understand this, you will eventually will play the part of the fool. You will destroy your life. Whatever it is that you're not surrendering to him, whatever it is that you're not honoring him with, Satan will use that, and you'll end up on a path of destruction with tons of shame and tons of regrets. So let me me try to illustrate this in a way that we can understand this honor God, he'll honor you principle, okay? Let's 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 talk to all the single folks for just a second. All the single ladies and all the single men, let's talk to you for just a second, because I'm sure that you're swiping left and swiping right, right? You're you're finding somebody that you want to spend the rest of your life with, and you're playing the dating game. Now, here's my question. Are you honoring God in your dating relationships? Because if you're honoring God, he will honor you. Or are you dishonoring God? We live in a day and age where people go out on dates, and even after one date or two dates, they're already in bed with each other, sleeping with each other. And we live in a day and age where it's quite common for people to be living together in the relationship. And when you ask somebody, why are you living together? They'll say, well, we're just making sure we're compatible. We're just taking this thing out on a test drive. Listen, if you're a male and a female, the parts are compatible. Do you understand what I'm saying right now? You don't need to take that out on a test drive for thousands of years. We've known those things work. You understand what I'm saying? So you don't need to figure that out for yourself. So many dating relationships are leaving people in worse shape than the way that they found them. And the reason for this is because they're dishonoring in that relationship. They're in the relationship for what they can take from somebody else rather than how they can serve the other person. And so then they end up in these relationships that are dysfunctional, that aren't honoring of God. And they start coming to church. And we have lots of folks that come to our church. I'm glad that you're here. We're living together. That's great. I'm, I'm glad you're here. You're dishonoring God. And, and, and you shouldn't expect for God to honor your relationship until you repent and you make things right. Listen, 90% of the couples that come to us that say they want, finally want to get married are already living together. And so we look at them and we say, well, that's great. Are you ready to separate right now before marriage? Are you ready to stop having sex so that the wedding night would be something special? Are you ready now to honor God? And many times they're not. And so we look at them and we say, okay, let me see if I get this straight. You've dishonored God this entire relationship. You've basically given God a middle finger and said, I'm going to do whatever I want to do in this relationship. I don't care about holiness. I don't care about purity. I'm going to do what I want. But now you want to get married, so you want to stand before your family and friends and before God, and you expect him to honor this relationship. Do you realize how ludicrous that is? What what if you started fresh again? What if you did it the right way? What if you did it God's way? What, What if when you're going out with somebody for the first time, you just set your standards with that person right off the bat? You say, listen, we're not here to have sex. We're here just to get to know each other better. This is a potential friendship. God might do something here that would intersect our paths to where we would end up being married together and having a family together. But we're not going to test drive this thing. out. We're going to serve each other. We're going to honor God in this relationship. So you need to run off the bat. I'm a child of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I'm committed to purity. I'm committed to holiness. So my question to you, the person that you're dating, is are you committed to that as well? Do you want to honor God in this relationship? And if they don't want to, then get away from them. Don't put yourself in that situation where they're pressuring you and you feel like you have to give something away. How many more broken hearts do you need? How much more pain and shame do you have to live with before you decide that you're going to honor God? And so you say, listen, if you're not interested, that's okay. Because my God is big enough. Don't you believe that your God is big enough that he can bring a person into your life that's smoking hot and also smoking hot for God? My goodness. If he places every planet up there, every universe, every star, certainly he can bring someone you're attracted to who loves the Lord. And if you'll honor him, he'll honor you and he'll do it. But if you dishonor him, well, you're going to reap what you sow you're going to end up with a very dysfunctional relationship and you're not setting yourself up for success. 
Let me, let me give you another practical way. Let's talk about money because that always ticks people off. Let's do that one next, okay? <laughs> now, this doesn't apply to anybody who's not a follower of Christ. This does not apply to you, so you can just kind of tune me off for the next five minutes. This is only for those who proclaim that they have a relationship with Jesus. The Bible commands you to tithe. It's not optional. You are to tithe. Give 10% of your income to the things of God so that the message of Jesus Christ can be spread. Here's the problem for a lot of people who profess faith in Christ. They don't honor God in the area of their finances. Even though the Bible says we're a manager of those finances, we're a steward of those finances, that every good gift has come from him, we hoard it for ourselves. And we build up our little kingdom. And we spend money in frivolous ways. And all that stuff that we buy clogs up our garages, clogs up some storage facility, and becomes the highlights of our garage sale five years from now. And a lot of us, we're living our life this way. You're so far in credit card debt, so far in this debt and that debt. And the reason you're in the situation you're in is because you've never honored God. You've never honored God in the area of your finances, so guess what? He has not honored you. And then you come to this church, and isn't it a great church? And I'm not talking about the buildings. I'm talking about the people. These are the greatest people, the most generous people. Well, some of us are. And then we come to church, and you hear about what the church is doing. The church is the people. And you see, 86 different churches now have permanent facilities because of these people's generosity. You see that we've packed 2.1 million meals for Feed My Starving Children. We have fed millions of people because of the generosity of this group of people. Well, not all of us, but some of us. And every single time you've given your tithe, every time you've leveraged your resources, you've had a piece in all of this. Every baptism, you've had a piece of that. Every marriage that's restored, you've had a piece of that. Every church that's been launched, every campus that's been opened, you've had a piece of that. So here's my question. What's it feel like to come here, see all these amazing things, and know you're not a part of it? Because you're not honoring God. What's it like swimming in a pool of debt, building your kingdom of mud that's here today and gone tomorrow? some point in time, what we got to do, we have to repent. Oh, friends, let me me tell you one of the cool things that we just did about a month ago. That This is my first opportunity to tell you about it. Your tithes and your offerings are making a difference in people's lives. You know we we have a campus now in Pakistan, and and that is not a safe place to have a campus. And we've shown you the pictures. We've shown you the video. What we didn't show you are the slaves that we've been able to release because of your financial contributions. To get money to Pakistan, we have to transfer it through a whole bunch of different banks because for some reason, Pakistan doesn't want money from the United States. And so we get the money there, and we have found as we administered in Pakistan that there are people who are slaves. How'd they become slaves? Well, they took on a debt. And the slave owner took them into their family, into their home, and now they force them to make bricks 12 to 15 hours every day. Here's the problem. The slave owner doesn't pay them a decent enough wage to live on and pay their debt. So basically, these people get themselves into a situation where they will be slaves for the rest of their life. Modern day slavery. So far in our prototype of trying this out, we have freed up three families, about 20 individuals. One of the families has been a slave for 30 years. 30 years. Guess how much money it costs to free them. Guess how much money they owed. It was $300. But go buy that new phone. Go get that big house. Drive that super cool car. Doesn't matter the one that you got's already great. Just spend all you can on yourself and rob God. Dishonor him. And you think you're going to be honored by him? And here's what's interesting. What does the Bible say? God says, test me in this. Test me in this. And see if I don't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing upon you. You don't have room enough for it. Don't you want to be a part of something like that? I want to leave this world in better shape than the way I found it. Let me give you another one since I got everybody mad now. Okay, we might as well just keep going. Let me talk to you about marriage. 
Because there are so many marriages that are just hanging on by a thread in this room and at home. Why is that? It's because you're not honoring God. Christy and I, today is our 30th anniversary. We've been married for 30 years. I know all that applause is for Christy because you're like, wow, she's taking one for the team right there, I tell you what. Good for you, Christy. I don't know anybody else that could have pulled that off, I tell you right now. Why is it I can sit here and say to you that I'm more in love with my wife than I was the day she walked down that aisle? And I am. Why is it? Because we've done our best to honor God. Jesus is the centerpiece of my married relationship with my wife. We pray together every night. Uh, We pray three or four times a day together, to be honest with you. We read scripture together. We serve God together. We talk about spiritual things. This isn't some game to us. See, we know what we're capable of. We know about our selfishness and our stubbornness. We know how it's easy for us not to forgive the other person, to nag the other person. We also know that's not like Jesus. And so we pray every day, how can I serve the other person? How can I put the needs of the other person ahead of myself? Two people serving the needs of the other person, that's a beautiful relationship. We're just trying to honor God. And we've honored him, and guess what? He's honored us with a beautiful, beautiful relationship. And we have three beautiful daughters. All my kids love Jesus with every fiber of their being. They have their own personal relationship with him. That did not happen by accident. We studied the Word of God together. We memorized Scripture together. We talked about spiritual things. Everything was through the litmus test of what would Jesus do. And they fell in love with Jesus. And now they have a relationship. They have their own. Some of them are already married. They're going to keep Christ at the center of their relationship. You honor God, He'll honor you. Or you can do the opposite. Just blow off everything I just said. Don't read the Bible. Don't do it. What's the, what's the point? There's no, there's no use in that, right? Don't read the Bible because most of us don't. Don't read it together. Don't pray together. And if you do pray together, just say that same meaningless prayer you say every single night. You know, the repetitious one that goes the same way as it always goes. Don't pray big, hairy, audacious prayers over your kids. Don't serve in the church. Just show up once every, I don't know, four to six weeks. Because, you know, if it's fixed in our schedule, then great, we'll show up. I mean, the traffic out there is ridiculous, I tell you that. And we'll just come when it's convenient. And Jesus will just be an afterthought. You dishonor him. And you're heading for a very dysfunctional marriage and a dysfunctional family. Josiah says, listen, I'm I'm not going that direction. I've seen that. I've seen it in my grandfather. I've seen it in my dad. I, I don't want any part of that. And so here he is, the king. And so what's he do? He tears down every pagan shrine. He tears down every pagan temple, every pagan altar. He says, we're not going to leave a hint in this country that paganism was ever a part of who we are. I read a story this past week about a young man who wanted to find a house for him and his wife and his, his young daughter. And they found one out in the country and it was everything that they hoped that it would be. The price was absolutely perfect. They walked from room to room to room. They're like, this is our dream home. And they talked to the old man who owned the home. He said, I'll sell it to you for this price on one contingency. I just want to keep property of one rusty nail. Well, they thought that was the weirdest request of all. Why in the world is this guy so fixated on one rusty nail? Well, they thought it was a strange request, but the price was so perfect. They're like, sold. You can keep possession of your one rusty nail. We get the rest of the house. He said, sounds good. They wrote the contingency up. They signed the paperwork. And now they moved into the house, and it was everything they dreamed it would be. Then about three weeks into it, they get a knock on the door. So they open up the door, and there's the old man. And they said, well, hey, it's great to see you. He says, how are you enjoying the house? They said, oh, we're loving the house so very, very much. He said, that's fantastic. I just wanted to get access to my one rusty nail. Is that okay? Oh, that's right. That was the contingency. Come on in and use your nail. So he came in. And he placed a dead crow on the nail. Have a good day. Whoa, 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 whoa. What do you do? It's my nail. I can do whatever I want with it. You're joking me. They thought after an hour he'd come back. He didn't. But every two, three days, be a knock on the door. I like access to my nail. And he replaced the dead bird that stunk, was full of maggots and flies, 20 feet away from their kitchen in their living room. 
And he'd just change it out for another bird, and then another bird, and then another bird. How long could you live with this? Well, the wife went to her husband and said, I can't live like this. We've got to get rid of this place. Well, they started to show it. How can you show a house and someone be interested when this is what you have in your front room? Nobody was going to buy it except for the old man. The old man says, I'll buy it back at a reduced discount. What's the point of the story? Whatever small thing you have in your life that's not honoring of God will stink the rest of your life up. So here's the question. What do you have? What, what are you playing with? What are you messing with? What, what is it that you have in your life that you, you know, immediately when I said, what are you doing that's dishonoring to God? Something came into your mind. Are you going to just let it stink the rest of your life up? Josiah says, no, 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 we're, we're tearing down all the pagan temples, all the pagan shrines. We're not even going to leave a hint of this. And they, they start to refurbish the temple. They're going to open the temple of God back up again. And when they're looking through the, the wreckage of the temple, they find the Scripture. And they begin to read the scriptures to Josiah. I want you to see what he says. He says, when the king heard the words of the Lord, he tore his robes. Why did he tear his robe? Because he realized in that moment in time that his country had turned his back on God. That his country was dishonoring of God. And he thought to himself, how can our country ever receive the blessing of God when all we do is dishonor him? Sound like any country you know today? We have, as a nation, turned our backs on God and on His Holy Word. We have made what's right wrong and what's wrong right. We are so upside down and so jacked up, and we wonder why we're so dysfunctional. Dysfunctional as a people. And then we have the audacity to pray that God would bless the United States of America when all we've done is give a middle finger to Him. We have dishonored Him, and we are reaping what we have sown. Josiah hears the word of God. He tears his robe and he says this in verse 13. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. Now I want you to see God's response to Josiah because I want you to get this. God is eager to forgive. God wants to bless your life. And if you'll turn to him and honor him, he will honor you. You're never too far gone. 2 Kings 22, verse 19. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they would become a curse and be laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors and you'll be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. God says, because you honored me. I'm now going to honor you. So again, are you dishonoring God? Is your attitude honoring of God? Are the choices that you're making honoring of God? Is the way you treat other people, is it honoring of God? Are you personally applying the word of God to your day-to-day life or is it just shoved away in some desk drawer and it's forgotten about? It's been discarded and has no place in your life. If you honor God, he'll honor you. I was reading this book by uh, Francis Chan and he mentioned a verse of scripture, Isaiah 66 verse 2. It says this, this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. Francis said, I read read that verse of scripture, and I realized I'm not doing that anymore. He said, there was a day that I trembled at the very word of God. I had a proper awe and reverence and fear of God, but that that day was long gone. And now he was become too casual, too casual with the, the things in his life that were out of sync with what God's will and God's plan was for his life. And he reads that verse of scripture and says, oh God, bring me back the joy of my salvation. Bring me back to that point to where I read your word and it so cuts me like a surgeon taking out a tumor. That it heals my soul, it heals my purpose, it heals my future. Oh God, may I tremble. May I tremble at your holy word because it is the very word of God. How many times you come to church, how many times you read the Bible and it's obvious what you need to change? Here's my question, do you change? Because most of us, if we're honest, 
We're the same way we were the week before and the week before that and the week before that. And every time you come here, God reveals something that he wants you and him to work on together. Here's the interesting thing about change. Just because you know what you need to change doesn't mean you're going to. I read an article this past week. It had the following headline. It said this, change or die. That would get your attention, wouldn't it? The paragraph continued, what if you were given that choice, change or die? What if a well-informed, trusted authority figure said you had to make a difficult and enduring change in the way you think and act? If you didn't, your time would soon end, a lot sooner than it had to. Could you change when change really mattered? And according to the article, nine out of ten people couldn't. 90% couldn't make the adjustments. They couldn't make the changes. It was founded on a study done by Dr. Edward Miller, former CEO of the hospital at John Hopkins University. Dr. Miller studied patients who had bypass surgery, heart bypass surgery. Their hearts were so sick they had to have bypass surgery. He said, I would sit down with them as they were getting ready to be discharged. And I would say, listen, things have got to change. If you'll exercise, if you'll eat right, you have a long life ahead of you. But if you keep doing what you've been doing, you don't go for walks, you don't get on a bicycle, you don't get on a treadmill, you do no exercise, you eat like you ate before, you will die. So do these things, you'll live. Don't do these things, your life's going to be a lot shorter. So he followed them, tracked their progress for the next two years. You know what he found out? 90% of them didn't make any change at all. 90% of them, in the face of death or a shortened life, didn't exercise, and they were still eating McDonald's, Big Mac, side of supersized fries, and a chocolate shake. That's a good time, but that's also 3,000 calories. You understand what I'm talking about right now? That will mess your ticker up. That's a shot to the ticker that nobody wants to have. So, you know, I'm working on this message. Going to honor God, honor us. There's changes that need to take place. You already know what they are. You knew them before you even got in here. I know in five minutes we're going to leave. You're not going to do much with it. As soon as I say talk to somebody you don't know and make a new friend, you're going to talk to the person you came with and say, where do you want to eat? (laughs) And all the things that God's speaking to you about right now, they're going to go on the back burner. You're going to go home. You're going to watch some football, and you're not going to change a doggone thing. 90% of you. So... No hope for you. What are you laughing about? No hope for you either. The only 10% that's going to do it, right here in the middle. You're slightly off to one side. That doesn't include you, but it does include you, woo-hooer, okay? So for the 10% that want this, because you're sick of it. You're sick of living the same way you've lived before. You're sick of the cycle where you say, I'm going to change, and then you don't. For the 10% that take this message seriously, here's what you have to do. You have to surrender your will over to his will. And and I would love to be able to tell you that it's a one-and-done kind of deal. You just say one little prayer, and then from that point forward, it's just kind of over the hump, and everything's good. That's not the way it works. It's every day. Day after day, after day. God, lessen me more of you. I surrender my will to you. Oh God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth in my life as it is in heaven. God, help me to stay focused on this because I know what I'm like. I'll go back. I'll go back to the habit. I'll go back to the sin. I'll go back to the attitude. I'll go back to what I once was. And I don't want to be that way anymore. I don't want the regrets anymore. I don't want the shame anymore. I don't want that life anymore. When you finally get to that point, you've got to surrender. You've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross. And you've got to follow after him. And it's not a one and done deal. You do it again and again and again and again. And some some days you do it several times in that day. You just lay it back down and lay it back down and lay it back down. You say, when do I not, not, not need to do that anymore? The day you die is when you don't have to surrender anymore. Because every day is a battle. And it's between your will and God's will. So are you going to honor him or are you going to dishonor him? We sing some dangerous songs around here, don't we? 
You ever thought about the words that we sing? One of my favorite songs that we sing is an old hymn called I Surrender All. All to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give. And the chorus goes something like this. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. You've sung that song, haven't you? Here's my question. Have you lived that song? See, I think we should change the words around here. I think it should go something like this. I surrender some. I surrender some, some to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender some. That'd be more accurate, wouldn't it? What are you going to do? Hey, where, 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 where are we going to eat after this? Oh, you're going to ask it. But what if you sat down at the table wherever you eat and you said, I need to change this? Would you hold me accountable? Because I'm sick of living this way. And I'm sick of treating people this way. And I want to surrender this area of my life. And I know that if I don't have someone holding me accountable, I'm never going to be able to pull this off. Josiah, age eight, I'm going to honor God. He'll honor me. He'll do the same for you. If an eight-year-old kid can figure it out, (laughs) maybe there's hope for you and me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how many times have I played the part of the fool? Oh, my goodness. So many regrets. So much heartache. So much shame. I'm so thankful for Jesus. Lord, I want to honor you, and I know I'm not alone. We want to honor you, but it takes sacrifice. It takes surrender. It takes a daily commitment. Less of us and more of you. So, Lord, for the 10% that are going to do it, I pray you'd bless them. As they attempt to honor you, you would pour out so much blessing upon their life that they wouldn't have room enough for it, that you would grant them a peace that passes all understanding. Lord, they would be in the very center of your will, feeling your smile upon their face. Lord, for those of us who have dishonored you and there's areas that need to be realigned, I pray today would be the day we'd come to our senses and we would find that you are a good God, that you're gracious and you're forgiving. And you're eager to help us start over again. God, if there's any wicked way within us, reveal it to us so we might surrender it to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.